All right, uh, so thanks very much, Matt, um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so when Matt invited me to be on this panel, um, actually quite a while ago, I, my first thing was like, you know, I am not the cow expert. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, I, uh, I, I, I teach a class called Food and Power in the Geography Department, um, uh, and I've done a lot of research on different kinds of agricultural supply chains, but for the most part, um, not a lot in livestock agriculture. But I did, uh, several years ago, write a book on the history of freshness in different kinds of food. And one, in one chapter was devoted to the significance of freshness in milk, in which I had to learn a lot about dairy. Um, and I remember in my research had focused on New England, I remember being struck by how much, how dairy agriculture um, contributed more to the Vermont economy through uh, basically keeping the, 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 pad, the, the landscape looking pastoral than it did through milk itself. Um, and so I think, and that really brought home to me the, the, the kind of the, the many ways in which livestock agriculture is, has been an integral part of the, the, the northern New England economy. Um, and so when, uh, when we, and, and not just dairy, and so when we, uh, our panelists uh, had a little conversation last week by phone, we decided that our, we, given that there is a, um, a, a panel on the future of dairy tomorrow, that today in our panel we were going to, be, to talk about um, kind of more specifically than economies of livestock agriculture of alternatives to, to dairy in the region. Um, and what are, um, what are things that people have tried, what has worked, what are some of the challenges, what are different ways to combine possibly dairy with other kinds of, um, sort of um, livestock based livelihoods. Um, so those are some of the things that we, that we want to um, talk about in this, in this next um, few, of hour and a half. Um, so we're going to start uh, with Lorraine, uh, who's got these slides. Okay. Okay, that's a lot better. Yeah. All right, good. Um, so I come at this more from a farmer justice point of view. I've been a longtime dairy farmer activist, um, which has entailed many adventures for me throughout my life. Um, so I'm just going to take everybody, you know, zoom in to where we are here in the Northeast. Um, globally, 120 million dairy farmers. Uh, some of the largest, India is the largest uh, global dairy power worldwide. Some of the largest farms in the world are now found in other parts of the world, um, China has one of the largest dairy farms, 100,000 cows um, near the Russian border. Um, Saudi Arabia, massive dairy farms on a scale that you would not believe. Some of them bringing in the food for the cows from places like Arizona where they now own land. Um, Vietnam, 30 cows, 30,000 cow farms to supply some of the um, urban areas. So I feel like we are relatively small farmers here when most of us are speaking in this room, even if you may consider yourself a larger farmer, you're really peanuts compared to the uh, globalized scale of agriculture that we're seeing. Um, I wanted to bring today a map just that graphically depicts um, what's called the cow islands. So I'm taking you to the cow islands. These are the areas of our country where dairy farming is becoming um, increasingly concentrated with more cows on larger farms in fewer areas. There are areas of our country that are losing, they're on the trend, a downtrend. Um, so as you can see, the largest areas would be in California, um, Idaho, uh, the Texas Panhandle, um, and these are actually some of the drier areas of our nation. Um, if you take a look at my part of the state, uh, uh, part of the Northeast, and I actually come from um, central New York, so I come from the land of the uh, Haudenosaunee, um, and if I will give them a plug here today on, if you haven't looked at their white corn project, this is a corn that grew um, in New York for 1,400 years, so my friends at Ganondigan are trying to bring that back, so if you get a chance, go on the internet and look up white corn project. Um, but anyways, um, you can see the areas that are on, on a kind of a downswing. Um, 
In Western New York, we have uh, far larger farms, much uh, flatter farms, able to have large amounts of livestock, um, not, maybe maybe a lot more corn based than we are. And then if you take a look across New England and um, Central New York, Southeast New York, uh, Southeast of our country in particular is very dairy deficit. Um, you can see what the, the trend would be. Um, this is not to say that dairy is still not very important. Um, let me, sh if you could do the next slide, please. Um, the next slide shows dots of um, where we would see cows at, at this point in time. Um, this was a slide from uh, five years ago, so I think it's, it's changed somewhat. Each dot would equal 1,500 cows. Um, so we still see um, an extensive cow population, but I believe that the map, the first map that I showed you is really demonstrating the uh, rapid acceleration. Um, I know, and I, I brought a pamphlet with me, the number of smaller farms that have been going out of business has been very dramatic um, just in the past year, you know, I think a couple thousand farms. Um, so I've been a farmer for a long time, I guess, you know, I mean, I, uh, since I got out of high school, I, um, it's like almost 50 years now that I've been farming. Um, so when I was a kid, there were 600,000 dairy farms. Um, now there are less than 39,000. Um, growing up, we always felt very, very connected to New York City. Um, each of the regions that I showed you earlier are milk sheds, and I don't know if you're familiar with that term. People who are more knowledgeable about dairy know um, there are various milk sheds. Um, my New York State milk shed was traditionally designed to supply fluid milk for New York City. Um, so we have a very, um, very heavy reliance on the sale of fluid milk. Um, we have been punched right in the gut by sales of almond milk and um, oat milk and, and other types of milk, which I'll get into. Um, next slide, please. Um, the concentration that's occurring in agriculture and dairy is not, is, we're not alone. If you would take a look, um, you can see how concentrated uh, various products are in terms of being produced in very small regions. Um, th and this is um, a slide that I had found up talking about the um, almond. Almonds are produced in uh, just a handful of counties in California, a large percentage of our broccoli. Um, and there are some broccoli projects out there. I don't know if you know about bringing broccoli back to the Northeast. Um, you know, many of our vegetables are produced in a very limited um, number of counties. Um, I, taking a look at dairy, we are a, produced across many models in many regions. I think that makes for greater resiliency of food production, where resiliency and redundancy, where if one region fails or has catastrophic issues that um, other regions step in. Um, so I wanted, our connection being in the New York City milk shed was very, very close. Um, we grew up really believing that we were better than other farmers because we supplied New York City. Um, we were like, oh, you know, when the milk truck would pull in and they would say the milk is going to New York City, we would, we would uh, like tap dance in the barn and say, oh, the New York City, you know, we pictured Broadway. Um, you know, when we, we, were, we were very proud, um, thinking that we were um, you know, suppliers of the New York City milk shed. Um, I actually grew up in a militant farmer household. Um, when I was a little girl, I would sit on the fence and um, listen to farmers who had led milk strikes in the 1930s. So my mother would always let me go and um, sit on the fence. And I would hear those farmers talk about uh, Mayor LaGuardia coming up to upstate New York to ensure a fluid milk supply when the milk strikes happened. Um, during the Depression years, the handful of largest milk companies like Borden's really dominated the price. Um, so there were major um, and sometimes violent milk strikes in the 30s. So I, when I was a little girl, I would listen um, to these people talk about how they had um, dumped enough milk to shut off the milk supply to New York. Um, Mayor LaGuardia intervened and begged the farmers to meet with the milk handlers at the, uh, because of the World's Fair buildings. Um, I also listened to the women um, older farmers talk about um, how they had dumped milk and blocked milk trucks. And I thought to myself, I'd like to be a militant farm woman. I think that's a good thing. Um, so I, I, did <laughs> I did continue that in life. Um, so um, we had another relationship in our area that we always knew about is that um, New York City extracted the water from the New York City watershed. So we thought of um, the city as uh, you know, that we had powerful landscapes able to supply the city. 
Um, I was also very much an activist in terms of New York City garbage. We also grew up with garbage trucks coming through our town on a daily basis, bringing the garbage upstate from the city, and that continues today to uh, you know, maybe 5,000 tons a day, I think, goes to Santa Clamato, so the garbage trains are, are rolling from the city. So I'm very much aware of the garbage that's in my town that will never leave, of hazardous waste that's a permanent repository in my particular town for um, garbage from the city. Um, so through that I had tried to work in many um, New, York, New York State garbage and recycling issues. Um, so I, I brought a display talking a little bit more about my particular farm. Um, my farm is, we, our hallmark is we are um, a grazing herd, we've always loved to graze our cows. Um, back in 1989 we hired wildlife biologists to map out the habitats on our farm. So I, I found the wildlife biologists people to be very interesting and a lot of fun. Um, we learned that we had um, upland sandpipers that are birds that leave every year to go to Argentina, to our, um, I guess what we call them, our sister habitats. Um, so they go to the pampas every year. Um, we also have um, northern harrier hawks. And I, I brought a table where I displayed, I have a book from um, Frances Hammerstrom, who was the only woman ever to get a master's degree under Aldo Leopold, um, came to survey the Harrier hawks on our farm. So um, we always really believe very strongly in protecting the, the habitats of the, these particular birds and um, you know, trying to teach other people about them. And um, so that's one of, been one of the great pleasures of our life is that we, they, they are still there today. Um, and this is in the face, I put a map out of advancing subdivisions. Um, there is a country club down the road from our farm and also Sprawl from Utica is moving in. So for us, we have to um, try to keep our head above water and be able to pay the land taxes. So at this point, our land taxes are actually more than our income. So um, I have to supplement the farm with my income from my attorney job, which I'm very glad that I became an attorney so that I could make money to help, help um, pay the bills and the taxes on our land. So um, I, wanted, I thought what Melanie said was very important. Um, the, there's, a, there's something changed between when I was a kid and um, the, the image of the farms and the cows now. Um, in 2009, there was another milk price crash. Um, and at that time, my friends had organized buses to go to um, Washington, D.C. to beg for help. So uh, I think my three, three busloads of farmers were boarding buses from points across um, the Northeast um, and trying to get into DC to literally beg for help. So I said, well, I will start calling New York City food groups, like food movement groups, and see if they would say anything to help. So I got on the phone and I started calling food groups. Um, and the very, almost at the same day that my friends were boarding buses, um, there was a conference in New York City called Food and Climate Change. So I innocent, innocently called them and said, hey, you know, the farmers are really, really having a hard time upstate. And they were like, are you kidding? We're not interested in dairy. Um, you guys are polluting the planet. You're ruining everything. Um, and I, w I was like flabbergasted. Um, so, you know, I tried to speak with the mayor's office and um, Scott Stringer was hosting the conference saying that, um, no, you know, you shouldn't eat meat, you shouldn't eat dairy, um, drink water, dairy should be removed from the plate, the food plate, um, you know, and, and why? Because you're ruining the planet. Um, you're polluting. You're, you know, um, your cows eat grain. You know, just you know every possible thing. And I, I was actually like flabbergasted. So I, I often thought of what Melanie said earlier. What changed? How did how did we go from people caring about us in the '80s to suddenly being the you know being um, uh, the undesirables? Um, I had asked, actually had asked to speak at numerous food conferences in the city, and um, on many occasions the people had said to me, oh no, we're only interested in good local food, um, we're only interested in organic vegetables, or maybe if you made an artisan cheese we would like you. Um, <laughs> so I, and I went to one conference and everyone was drinking almond milk, and I said, why are you drinking almond milk? And they were like, because it saves the planet. Um, so, um, you know, which I want to mention another, th another thing too. I don't know if you know about the bees, but um, our, farm, our farm is called Honeydale. Um, so um, we, our, uh, our beekeeper doesn't allow our bees to travel, but 60% um, of the nation's commercial bees are hauled to California to pollinate the almond groves every year. Um, and our beekeeper is very upset about, basically he won't allow our hives near anybody who's taken their bees to California. 
because of, he's afraid of the spread of um, mites and diseases, um, which he feels are bringing back um, issues and decimating our native bee populations. So, um, you know, now in the city, I've also seen the rise of oat milk. Um, so Oatly is a company that's owned by, um, partially owned by Chinese investors and investors from Scandinavia. So they've established what I call a beachhead in um, New Jersey. They're um, actually being bottled by one of the dairy cooperatives. Um, so I, I confronted one of the, co the cooperative board members and said, why are you bottling this so-called oat milk? And they said, oh, hey, there's some money in it. Um, so if somebody's gonna make some money, it might as well be us. So um, I think um, there's been a severing of communications between the farmers and the, the typical consumer. Um, and I don't know how to bring that back, but I, this conference is a wonderful start. Um, I did, there were a few things that some of us have tried to do to make money, um, and that are a few programs like um, dairy beef. Um, dairy cows can be very tasty. Um, <laughs> and I know that maybe that sounds really bad if you're a vegan, but we do, we do put uh, beef, beef cows in the freezer. And um, maybe go to the next slide. Oh, this is, oh, this is one of the Upland Sandpipers. Um, so they're, um, that we, these birds were, um, uh, their populations have crashed across the Northeast, and Audubon has documented that their populations are down by almost 99% in some areas, um, it, you know, especially in Massachusetts. Um, so um, I've actually con um, spoken with some of the people at Harvard when they, they pronounced that you shouldn't drink milk because it's ruining the environment, and I've asked them, well, what about your upland sandpipers in your Massachusetts habitats, and they're clueless. So I think we really need wildlife biologists and we need to get out of our silos, as someone mentioned earlier. Um, so next, next slide. Um, this is a young couple who milked 300 cows. Um, they've been kind of tried to diversify into other things. They sell dairy beef, they have a, a flock of sheep, they sell wool products, um, and, and they're really a lot of fun, but they're young and they're energetic. Um, you know, I don't know how they do it all, but they, they manage to, to stay afloat. And one last slide is, um, in going back to uh, Justice, um, there is one lone cheese maker in, that I know of. She has a label called Fair Shake Milk, where she pledges to pay all of her dairy farmers $20 per 100, 100 way. <laughs> so she had, Susie Jones has her little Fair Shake label. So I've asked some of the larger um, milk processors if they would pay $20 a 100, and then I tell them about our, you know, our habitats and all that, and they double over in laughter. Um, ha, fair shake milk, well, there's no such thing, you know, that's it. So I guess you want, if you want to look at my table later, I've got some stuff, but. Why don't you explain the hundred weights? Oh, so we're paid by whatever a um, hundred pounds of milk will bring. So um, right now we're getting maybe $16 per hundred, for a hundred pounds of milk. Um, that's about 11 and a half gallons. Yeah, it's 11 and a half gallons. Um, and then we have deductions for transportation. We have to pay to transport the milk to the plant. Um, then when the milk gets to the plant, um, the, the, the largest yogurt manufacturer in our state also charges us for um, parking the trucks by the plant. You know, if we, if, if we get a docked in our pay price if the trucks take too long. Um, so, you know, same thing, thing with Walmart. You know, I have some clients who are vegetable producers. They have to pay to dock their truck, dock their truck there. They have to pay for dockage time. So those are some of the kind of things I deal with as an attorney. But um, anyway, so I did bring a table um, with me. Um, I asked each of my neighbors to contribute. Sorry, just repeat that one more time. $16 for 11 and a half gallons of milk. That's whole milk. They are able to extract the um, fat out of the milk and use it for other products and then sell the 1% and 2%. So um, actually one of our farmers confronted um, a congresswoman last night at a meeting, um, Amy Stefanik in Northern New York. and. Um, she said, hey, we're, you know, we're starving, we can't, we can't make a living. Um, and, and Elise responded, well, you're making $16, it's better than the 13 you were getting. So last year it was down to almost $13 a hundred, so we had, there were three farmer suicides in the Northeast um, that I know of. Um, but anyway, so I brought a table of, of stuff with me if you guys wanna take a look at it later. Just some fun things, I bought the, bo the book about the Harrier Hawks that was written by my friend. Um, and I've got the, a map of our farms. Um, so we, we farm jointly with another family farm that, that's out on the table, you know, basically what we try to do. And everybody contributed a little something to the table. I've got a, a Cabot Creamery 100 Years tin. I've got a, um, some empty bull semen straws from a, a bull named Honeybee. Um, I've got, um, <laughs> I've got um, calf bottles. So you guys might want to take a look at some of the accoutrements of dairy farming and if any of the farm workers are 
know people will be familiar with this stuff, so I'll stop by and say hello. And a couple books that I like include, I put Teresa's book out there, so thank you, sorry. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, uh, and it's an honor to be here from the land of almonds. Sorry. <laughs> um, and just riffing off of the milk shed, um, so the work that I do is a little different related to end product. I work with fibers, and the organization that I operate and run is Fiber Shed. So the idea is similar to a milk shed in that you're identifying a strategic geography that can close you. And I'm not sure if there's um, slides or not for this presentation. They're on the computer. Um, and it's okay. I can also, it's not a big deal. <laughs> They're not essential. Um, so in, in this region, actually, um, the, so the fiber shed concept started um, in 2000. Well, they've always existed, actually, to be very frank about it. Fiber sheds have been... Um, like watersheds and food sheds, they just possibly haven't had the definition of word and language, but from a topographical and rainfall and grass and land perspective, these are landscapes um, that have always been present. So defining that landscape took some time, and so what I tried to do to define my fiber shed was to actually dress myself for one year from the closest geography I could to my home. So all the fiber, all the color, all the dye, and all the community that helped metabolize those materials into garments, they all lived within 150 miles of my front door. And so I was underwear and socks and bathing suit and everything was literally grown from my home region in North Central California. So I, I don't literally live totally in the almond country. I live about, um, an hour and a half north of San Francisco uh, in a county called Marin County in West Marin County. My family's been there since 1896. Um, so I'm pretty tied in with this particular geography um, and what it, and the biological diversity of this region. It's, um, I, I got my engagement with this region through natural dyes and through a color palette, like what was the language of the landscape that could be expressed I'm wearing an oak gall dyed um, from our black oak trees. Um, this is black oak, oak galls dyed on a brown color grown cotton that we grow biodynamically about two hours from my home and my friend Dan sewed the jacket. Um, my jeans are dyed in indigo that I grew and are hand woven um, by a friend of mine and sewn also by another friend <laughs> um, using organic cotton from our region. So in terms of discussing the the methods for revitalizing a system that I think is, I would beg to say it's far more broken than the milk system <laughs> in terms of fiber. By weight, 70% of your wardrobe on average is made out of plastic. So um, the, the, the fossil carbon sources for our clothing and textiles dominate the wardrobe of, 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 our, of our lives. Um, the natural fiber systems have been um, made opaque and fairly anonymous, and so have the supply chains. Less than 1% of the clothing purchased in the United States is fair trade. Less than 1% of the cotton grown in the United States is certified organic. Um, we are growing, well, less than 2% of what we wear is a bast fiber, like nettle or flax or hemp globally, so all these fibers that have a lot of efficacy from an ecological perspective really aren't even that available to you. Um, so what I started to do is, after I dressed myself, I started to come into this reality of there was um, wool being thrown in ditches and wool being burned, and wool, um, when I would go to these sheep shearings, um, which are very humane places that I've observed, I've been to over 100 sheep shearings, contrary to billboards in Los Angeles <laughs> that tell you not to wear wool and 
These things, um, up close and personal, the sheep shearing is actually done for animal welfare reasons, um, it's to actually maintain the health of that animal. Um, so in that space, the, the, the wool, I was handling it, and it was beautiful, and it was, it had um, a lot of potential. I'd much rather wear wool than acrylic, polyester, or nylon, which are polluting our marine and terrestrial ecosystems, and in 90, <laughs> there's microfiber plastic lint in 94% of America's drinking water. Um, our clothes, our, our plastic clothing is permeating our bodies and our biosphere. So it was so odd to see this alternative getting burned, this natural fiber, this natural grass-fed protein literally not being utilized. So I got into that a little deeper and then I analyzed um, with a team from UC Davis that we had 3.1 million pounds of wool annually pulsing off the landscape over a million pounds of it was as high of quality as you would see coming out of Australia, low micron count, like you could wear it next to your skin. So the shirt I'm wearing is um, now Montana wool. So we're starting to see some American wool come through supply chains, domestic supply chains. Um, I guess this is doing its own rotation. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> You're doing good. Um, well, I'll, um, let's see, go back for the hat. Um, yeah, so the hat. We'll stay there for a moment and I'll explain. From an economic perspective, our, our sheep shears um, were getting paid enough um, to make their costs covered, but the farmer was often paying more to shear the sheep um, than they could get for the wool. And, and so the wool also wasn't making it to these commodity locations very easily. It was, you had to put, pay more for gas to get your, your wool even to a commodity drop-off point. There was a little bit of wool of that one million pounds of fine wool that was getting brought to commodity markets and sent overseas to China for processing. Um, so this particular ranch, um, and I'll explain this narrative. So here we are in this, with this very undervalued resource. And here we are wearing materials imported from overseas with very horrific supply chains associated with them. And, chemistry that we wouldn't want processed in our home communities, but we're importing it from overseas. So these supply chains have huge amounts of inequity um, related to environmental toxicity and environmental justice. So here we have materials we could be using in our home community that are undervalued. How do we develop supply chains to put these really fine micron count natural grass fed proteins on local human skin? So that was a question, and one of the, the intersectional points that I think brought this work together was to combat some of these ideas around enteric fermentation. So cows, fart, sheep, felch, um, this has been identified as this climate problem, but how could we actually look, get away from that conversation and look at the grass-fed um, protein system as, as a place where we could explore um, whole ecosystem function analysis. How can we look at the whole farm and ranch? And Dr. Jeff Creek and Tori Estrada will talk more about this, um, I think, today and possibly tomorrow. But how could the whole farm or ranch be looked at for its capability to increase what you'll hear more about, photosynthetic capture? Meaning, how could we actually enhance this, these sheep graze landscapes to draw down more carbon, CO2 even, they're emitting? And could we tether that those, that carbon drawdown measurement to the actual wool that's being produced on this farm or ranch. So we went to the northeast part of California, I did after I did this analysis, and I found this huge flock in a very remote county, um, very co politically conservative county, and um, they decided that they were interested in having their wool stay domestic. They were really into American-made products. I was also in conversation with an East Bay based brand, you've probably heard of it, the North Face. And the North Face was interested in doing things closer in their backyard. They were inspired by my personal one year wardrobe challenge. And so I brought jars of wool in ball mason jars. That's all I could do. I said, here's some wool from these ranches. And they had never touched wool. These are designers. <laughs> so they're touching wool in ball mason jars and it's greasy. What's this? Oh, that's lanolin. That's a water repellency. And they're like, wow, you mean you don't need perofluorinated carbons for that? <laughs> like, no, you can just use grease. Um, I mean, maybe that's a strategy we should investigate. So they were interested in all of these things that were coming off the sheep. Um, and they felt this one wool type, and they're like, that's the one we want to work with. 
and it happened to be um, the most remote ranch of all of them. And so I, they said, but we really, you know, Rebecca, we've heard a lot about this work you've done with the Marin Carbon Project, and we've met Jeff, we've met John, like this was one of the designers who've met people in this community of scientists. We really want to see um, a climate beneficial wool project. How can we do this? And so um, with the help of the Carbon Cycle Institute um, and a local partner biologist um, who's helped us since, we have, um, and I'll, I have the carbon farm plan for this ranch. For every, it ended up being that the whole plan was designed, all of these practices um, were analyzed for their GHG imprint or, or capability for drawing down carbon on this landscape. So for every pound of wool we analyzed coming off this ranch, six to nine pounds of carbon were drawn down into the landscape. So the North Face knew at that point that they could work with a wool that within the farm gate, it had this positive imp impact. Um, now the supply chain is another story. We're rebuilding that supply chain. My organization is very much tied into economic development to rebuild the milling infrastructure that would metabolize that wool into the PCC. But this piece um, had to go to the East Coast for processing. Um, so we, we kind of blew our carbon footprint outside the farm gate. Um, but that showed us though that this, so this was the fastest selling beanie the North Face has ever produced. Um, it's got 2.5 times more social media traction than any garment they've produced. Um, it's now called the Cali Wool Project. They've increasingly, every year, been increasing the amount of wool they're purchasing from, um, from the Bear Ranch. Um, the Bear Ranch owners um, have now developed direct markets in addition to selling to the North Face. Uh, we've started a, a Northern California Fiber Shed Co-op to build more direct markets, and the Bear Ranch owner is um, on the board of directors of this new fiber co-op. So we're building out alternative infrastructure for direct markets while simultaneously positing our work with brands who can get the message out. So this is a transnational brand. They're, the large, they're part of the largest textile corporation in the world. They are not the best in perpetuity market for our farmers, but if we can use them as bullhorns to get the message out, which they're doing a very good job of, that actually a protein is climate beneficial that comes from a grass-fed system, and that you can wear something that's not plastic and it can keep you warm. This is a great message. Um, and so then we are, we are complementing that economic work with the co-op, um, which we've now developed an e-commerce site. It's like an Etsy for fiber farmers. So you can go and you can order direct from the farm. You can order pigments. You can order dye plant seeds. You can order finished garments, yarn. So here's a project to, um, just to show you how some of the commercial yarn makers are starting to pick up climate beneficial wool as well. This is another complement to our co-op. It's another way for the farmer to get rid of a 40,000 pound wool pool. They need to divide up and find all these different markets. Again, this wool was getting, I'll just to give the numbers, the wool was at about between a dollar and a dollar 25 a pound is what the producer was getting when we first met them. Um, now they're class two or their A2 wool um, with this climate beneficial premium, they're getting $3.60 a pound. A greasy weight. So it's really, it's, and it's helped them develop their own direct markets too. Like it's, it, they've actually had enough income to start making their own yarn. So they would never have got to make a finished product themselves. That was too expensive. So things are starting to change um, economically on farm from these projects. Let me see if we could go forward. Um, so here's materials, just to say what the comp the local manufacturing complement is to working with the larger brands. So we built the first wool mill that, or the first weaving mill that can weave wool um, this side of the Mississippi, our side, west, sorry, <laughs> California side of the Mississippi. Um, this is a, a 71,000 yard per year uh, mill. Um, so this wool, you see all this natural colored material and then this is a dyed piece in black walnuts. In 2017, we, we finally wove the first grown and woven and then sewn cloth that our state had seen. We hadn't seen this since 1891. Um, so we're starting to rebuild the manufacturing systems and in this particular loan agreement to build this, this mill, 
Um, we actually got a public related investment to build this mill and in the loan agreement it says this mill will only weave climate beneficial wool. All right. So it's another. Um, and I think we'll go to one more slide. So our nonprofit, so Fibershed started as a nonprofit. I, I assume we'll, as, as this movement grows, uh, we will move into more of a potentially a trade organization or for-profit space. I don't know what the future holds, but for now, because our system was so broken, we just needed to focus on education. It just took a lot of education. So we were a 501c3 to start. But these are some of the projects that we've done. So with the coarse wool that was getting thrown out the door and literally burned, we've now created bedding projects. So now we have um, producers who are getting 25 cents a pound, getting $2.50 a pound. Um, and then they're creating this, these pillows and duvets with a company called Koyuchi. Um, they're also developing their own direct markets. These are wool sponges. Um, wool sponges are selling very well um, in that whole, um, like getting yourself out of the no waste household people, the people who are developing these no waste lifestyles. The wool sponge, a biodegradable sponge is like, it's getting featured in Sunset Magazine. Um, it's getting featured by a lot of, I don't know, lifestyle leaders. <laughs> um, so Lauren Poncha, one of the ranchers at the top, and Jim Jensen, they have coarse wool in my region and this is feeding into this bedding work here. Um, and I don't know if there's another slide. And then this is Dr. Jeff Creek um, and John Estelle, the ranch owner um, up at Bear Ranch where the fine wool came from. The first project that was done at this ranch was, a comp was to develop a compost pad to make compost on site and then to apply that compost onto cropland um, and to, to start to move this system uh, into a place where it was um, again, you know, maybe hopefully not using synthetic nitrogen, and in this case, not anymore. Um, also, a place where um, the, the sheep are grazing on some of their croplands, and so these croplands, they just got, after three years, the compost applied alfalfa. Um, they're showing that they got, they doubled their yields after three years on the compost applied pivot. So it's a really exciting space um, to see that these natural systems making your own compost applying your own compost, you're doubling your yields in three years compared to pivots that are untreated. Um, we're starting to see this idea of the carbon farm plan actually improve the bottom line, not only in developing these new marketing tactics and, and strategies, but it's also improving yields. So this idea of capturing carbon on the landscape is changing the fundamental economic structure of this ranch. Um, and so it, we're just getting started, but I thought that this was a good pilot test um, to, to trial and also to then I'm really excited to be able to share it with you today. Um, I hope I think for 10 minutes, we're yeah. good? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm back, this time with my beef hat on. Um, I'm not going to read slides. I assume everybody can do that for themselves in the room. If somebody has visual impairments and needs uh, me to read that, please let me know. Um, we started Shire Beef in 2013 with three cows. And I, in a prior life, uh, had milked jerseys on a very small scale for six years uh, and taught myself with, with the help of a good friend, Suzanne Lupin, who will be speaking at the end of the, tomorrow, how to make cheese. And uh, this was before the raw milk uh, ordinances in the city of Vermont, and we had a, um, a raw milk 
and to Jesus. He's a. Um, now we are focusing on beef cattle, um, and are considering going back into milk in a very specialized uh, market of uh, A2, A2 milk, uh, which doesn't contain certain allergens um, that the mainstream milk supply contains. Um, So, I'm Nico Horster, um, founder, co-founder, and co-owner of Shire Beef. Um, we're in Berkshire, Vermont. Um, our land base there is about 160 acres. We um, have, are at an elevation of 1,200 to 1,800 feet. Um, it's pretty cold. We had snow until, what, four days ago or so. Um, and with this special place, and you can see, we look straight over the, this is sunrise on our land, uh, looking over the Connecticut River Valley, which is in the last veil before that mountain range you see in the background. Uh, we look straight on to Moose Lock Mountain, um, only quite dark. Um, and we see Mount Washington uh, from our land. So we have, uh, we are on the southern tip of the Vermont limestone belt excellent soils, um, and you can taste that. And f food is what builds us, literally. So let's talk about what makes it different. Um, we process about 50 beef animals a year. Uh, we'll grow over the next few years to about 70. Um, we keep only about 15 to 20 mother cows and their calves. Uh, they're purebred peen scours. Uh, peen scours are a heritage cattle from going back to Celtic times from Austria. They're very hardy. They like steep slopes and cold weather. Um, they also have one of the highest tenderness uh, gene, genes in their, gen in their genetics pool. Yes, better than black angus and finish excellently on grass. Uh, we buy the rest of the animals as feeders locally, mostly New York, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, and we feed only grass or legumes. Um, during the grazing season, we rotate them intensively. Uh, when the grass is growing fast, they rotate fast. And when the grass is growing slow, they rotate slow. Meaning, um, in two weeks when we will be out grazing, uh, they will spend half a day on a plot of land and they will graze over an entire acreage. Uh, in about 10 to 14 days, and then in the fall, that might be 30 or 40 days. Um, and in the winter, they eat baleage, which is grass and legumes that have been cut and, and siled with a plastic wrap, which is a horrible system of doing it, but we don't know if any better, somebody wants to invent a better storage system, that'd be great. Uh, we don't feed GMO products contain, containing GMO, no coi, corn, soy, antibiotics, or other feed supplements. Um, our cattle are usually ready to slaughter in about 22 to 26 months. They grade at high select or low choice, and then use the A finish scale, uh, which is comparable to what you get at the supermarket, um, only ours tastes a lot better. Um, our food supply has become incredibly nutrient poor. The USDA has just recently stopped testing certain food groups for the nutrients. The apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's now five apples when they stopped testing a couple of years ago. Uh, and the same is true with everywhere in our food supply. We are not getting the nutrients we need as for our bodies to sustain themselves, which is one of the reasons we have such a health crisis in this country. Um, so why is this food good? Again, you can read this by, by yourselves. Um, and by the way, these are all our steaks and photos are all from our land. Um, so you get incredible um, complete protein, omega-3 acids, in balance, conjugated linoleic acids, and so forth. Um, and what you don't get is you get you don't get herbicides, pesticides, growth hormones, antibiotics, which all are present in commercial beef because they all get finished the same way. And that grass-fed beef, despite the big sort of hype that's around it, and people saying, oh, grass-fed beef, what you see advertised on 
restaurant menus, which often is not grass-fed beef, or it's not from here, it's from New Zealand, or Australia, or Paraguay, or Brazil, um, is different. It doesn't, it doesn't contain these things, and, what was it going, oh, the grass-fed beef is only, I think, last time I checked, 3% of the meat market in this country. Um, so, what, what else do we do? Um, we rotationally graze our cattle, and through this rotation, we build soil. So, the beef that you eat from a, from a, a ranch or a farm that manages their soils the way we do has benefits that go so far beyond the, the benefit of the good food that you're eating. It is the microbiology in the soil that we're rebuilding. And through the microbiology, the carbon that the plants produce gets turned into a more stable form, and we'll hear all about that later. And through that, there's a slew of environmental benefits, um, and we can see the impacts of these on a daily basis, or on a yearly basis almost now, in here and in other places. We recently traveled uh, across the country on a flight to Houston, and we were probably flying two hours or so over a completely flooded flat land. That's tillage agriculture for you. Um, so we rotate our cattle over the same ground of land about four to six times a year, depending on how productive it is and depending on the, the micro weather events that happen. And uh, compare that uh, harvesting pattern with hay, which is typically cut two or three times now, sometimes also four times, but in a completely different way. We don't let our cattle graze beyond 40% of the growth of the plant because for us the benefit is the sugar in the plants is in the top 30-40%. That's what we want the cows to eat. In the Northeast we're predominantly C2 carbon based or cold climate based cold season grasses and that means we lack sugar but we have protein in abundance. So it's no problem growing calves to a certain size, but fattening them up is a challenge here. Unlike the vast majority of the rest of the country, they have the opposite problem. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the dairy industry and the feedlot industry uses corn, which is C4, carbon-based plant with a lot of sugar in it, um, and it fattens cows, like eating Twinkies. Um, So, um, by only harvesting the top 30%, uh, the plant never go goes out of the growth cycle, the roots never die down, so the biology keeps producing at its full rate all season long, which is really hard to do when you cut hay, because when you cut hay, you, you typically, the modern mowers cut it to about an inch, an inch and a half, and that automatically kills the roots. Well, it doesn't kill the roots. What happens is the plant now has to re-mobilize the sugar repository and the biology in the root system and draw those energies back out to regrow. Um, so we farm about 350 acres total. Um, I already said that. We offer all sorts of marketing services and um, we get compensated um, somewhat fairly for that. We have a very good wholesale account. We supply one of the larger burger outlets in the state of Vermont called Worthy Burger. And with beef um, and what is not built into this however is the stuff that I already started uh, talking about early on we're not getting paid for uh, energy conservation feedlot beef takes about 20 times as much fuel to raise as um, as grass-fed beef we're not getting paid for building soil and not tilling and not disrupting the microbiology of the soil um, we're not getting paid for the carbon sequestration that we're doing, which this is, I think, from a um, graphic that I found somewhere uh, in conjunction with Nicolette's work. Um, we estimate it's about 200 transatlantic flights that our cows sequester a year. It would be a great student project, maybe, for one of your students or group to actually do that calculation in detail. And we don't get paid to prevent this kind of stuff. Um, and we do not get paid to build community. And 
social fabric that is being destroyed all over the country because agricultural communities being industrialized and the life taken out of them. There's sort of this belt that goes from Pennsylvania all the way to the Rocky Mountains where nobody lives there anymore. And uh, when you drive through the rural towns, it is, it's really sad, but it doesn't have to be like that. So we have, we have the soil, we have the science, and we have the taste. Uh, but we don't have market access, we don't have a level playing field, or the financial recognition for the services we provide, other than some of the best meat in New England. Factors mean it's difficult to invest if these conditions are not. 
want more land under long-term sustainable management. So that 12% of farmers under 45 are managing 12% of the land base, and they're going to need to finance and grow to managing more of that land base, and we hope that they're going to manage more of it sustainably, and there's financing and transition management that needs to take place in there in order for those transitions to take place, and that's the sweet spot where dirt capital is working. These goals are dictated by the source of our funds, mostly individual and family offices who want a portion of their funds to support sustainable land management and driving viable rural economies. And thanks to Tom for giving me an opening to say how their capital is different than other investment companies. There is definitely a land grab going on out there, like you mentioned this morning. And most of the farmland investment that's going on is driven by the needs of the capital and not by the needs of the farmer. And in our case, we're buying particular properties for particular farmers and hoping to transfer those farms to those farmers over a five to 10 year period. And we're not speculatively purchasing land at all unless we feel like it's gonna serve those rural communities. And we believe that people that should own land ultimately in rural communities is the farmers who are on the ground and understand how those communities and those ecosystems work. And that's what we are facilitating in every transaction. And that's not most of what is going on in farmland investment. So. So we aim to take moderate risks to achieve our goals and utilize multi-dimensional underwriting, broad sector expertise, partnerships, and wraparound services to mitigate risk in our transactions. And the goal of each project, as I said, is to provide secure land access and transfer ownership to the farm to the farmer over a five to 10 year period. So a couple of our goals in detail, Dirt Capital is focused on first, land access and affordability. We work to fill gaps in the financing space. So we provide highly affordable, flexible, and secure lease arrangements, and we're not looking to be duplicative of other financing options. We're specifically problem solvers around gaps and fixing barriers to entry for younger farmers and providing transition solutions for exiting farmers. A second goal of ours is land conservation. We actively look to partner with land trusts. We're a willing seller of conservation easements, and we can close simultaneously with a conservation easement sale or act as a pre-conservation buyer when we're working on a transaction where an easement funds might be useful but aren't going to come through for a couple of years. And a third objective, of course, is farm viability. We have page four. Nationally, according to the 2017 census, which was just released, Farm income was $43,000 on average, and only 43% of farms had positive net cash income. Dirt Capital supports farmers with viable business models and seeks to do so in geographies where appropriate farmland can be made affordable for businesses. Actually, yeah, yeah, this one. Um, so we're looking at the intersection of farm viability, where there's viable business models where the geographies are that farmers have land that the cost fits those business models and where there's a good rural economy and support network for farmers in those businesses. And that's where we're working is in those overlaps. And that includes this area here um, in the Upper Valley where we have active pipeline projects. So we coordinate wraparound services and provide staff expertise to help farmers maintain viability and extend the resource base in smart ways with Dirt Capital's financial participation, which allows them to grow their operations profitably through their expanded resource base. Dirt Capital currently works with 21 farmers and has over $14 million invested in New England, New York, and New Jersey. We are actively making investments in fielding inquiries from farmers across the United States. About half the farmers we work with are first-generation farmers, and about half are multi-generation farmers. About 10 of them are wholesale dairies shipping food and milk to buyers like Organic Valley, and 10 of them are diversified businesses selling vegetables, meat, cheese, or other value-added products direct to consumers or through local and regional market channels. And one of them is an organic grain producer. So I want to share with you a story of a farm transition that Dirt Capital Finance. 
Jim and Ann Phillips are milk producers and they ship milk to Organic Valley, um, which is a farm cooperative. And they're based in Cortland County, New York, so central New York. They have 700 acres under management and they are in a lease with option to purchase arrangement with Dirt Capital on a 313 acre farm that now constitutes their home base. And they're a certified grass fed farm, which means they carry an additional certification on top of their organic certification. And they only feed grass and hay to their cows and not grain. And they also raise a red sheep. And I know we were talking a little bit about dairy alternatives on this panel, and I just want to say I think there's a number of ways to approach that. Some is through different market channels, like producing a product like cheese or yogurt, and we have farmers in our portfolio that do that. And I think just thinking in terms of our landscape in the Northeast and the fact that it's good for producing a lot of grass, and our last couple panelists have talked about the, the value of that in terms of nutrition and sequestering carbon, that the grass-based farms are utilizing the land in a way that is environmentally sustainable for the land base. They're sequestering that carbon, but also they're producing less milk and they're, they have less cows on the land base overall. So as you move towards that grass-based model, it also controls the supply side a little bit because you have sort of less cows to land ratio and it's more maybe in line with where the markets are going. So Jim and I were connected with Dirt Capital in 2013 through Organic Valley, and at the time we were leasing a smaller property, which they found through the Cornell Cooperative Extension, and it allowed them to get started, but it wasn't for sale, and they couldn't make needed improvements or expand their numbers. Leasing is a really important step for farmers because they build markets, they build equity, they develop a track record and they understand what property will suit their long-term needs and operations and markets best. About 40% of farmland nationally, according to the ag census, is leased, and the cost of leasing we find in our work can be 50% of the cost of owning. So first-generation farms often doesn't make sense and they can't justify based on their equity markets or financial track record or cash flow just starting out by buying all of their land. And most farmers don't own, own all of their land. Um, however, once a farmer's gotten started for three to 10 years, if they're a new farmer, leasing their home base you know, may not make sense. It might be inefficient depending on, you know, the farmer might need to make improvements, expand or plan for the future. And if they don't have a secure lease, that might not be the best situation for them to stay in. And that's the position that Jim and Ann were in. So it's common for farmers to spend significant time and effort developing a resource base for the farm. Uh, it's a capital intensive industry to be in and it takes, in some cases, generations because the right land only comes up so often and it can be hard for farmers to kind of piece together their land base and just in terms of the geography and the finances. So Jim and I were trying to figure out this puzzle. And so they had tried to purchase this farm in Maricon already in 2011, but the offer fell through. And then they contacted the farm again in 2014, working with their capital, and we purchased the farm on their behalf in 2015. And then we signed a nine-year lease with option to purchase arrangement with Jim and Ann. <clears throat> yeah, so improvements, I want to say a little bit about how that works in our lease because it's very important to the farmers. During the course of the lease, the farmers are able to make and in this case, the farmers contributed funds for a new milking parlor, and that helped them with their operational efficiency. Originally, they wanted to put one into the old barn um, and do a parlor conversion there, but it wasn't cost effective. And so if you look the barn all the way to that side, to the right, to your right, is the new barn. And we co-invested in that with Jim and Ann. And the farmers also made improvements using uh, federal funds, the NRCS and Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and they have that helped them invest in laneways for the cows and fencing and other things that help protect natural resources and species habitat um, that are prevalent on grass farms. So the total transaction cost was just under $1.3 million. The lease payments to Dirt Capital on the $625,000 per 
purchase price step up gradually over the lease term to get the farmer's cash flow. And the improvements for the milky parlor are amortized as a nine-year lease, which they pay as additional rent. And so they'll have part of that as equity when they purchase the principal portion that they pay down. And then uh, currently we're coming up on their early purchase option, their lease, which is in 2020. So they're actively planning now to exercise that purchase option and use farm credit lease financing to purchase the farm. Um, from their capital, and then they'll, they'll own it outright at that point. Nice. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, so I have all kinds of questions, but since the, um, um, we are, we, we've all like, have a whole lot to say here, um, I want to go, go directly to the audience for some Q&A, and um, we have about 15 minutes. <laughs> That's a good question. I have the mic. <laughs> That's, That's a great question. I didn't need one. I'm louder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we do receive inquiry, credit plan inquiries from New Hampshire, and we are looking to a project in New Hampshire. Yeah, I would like my state to matter. <laughs> your state matters. I am here I in person, and your state me. matters. And I'm glad you came. What's your name? My name is David. Um, 
in a position where they can do that, and frankly, not every farmer is, is in a position where they can do that, and if the kinds of um, other channels of financial support were available to make those transitions to more farmers, I think more farmers would consider it, but sometimes it does not fit their cash flow needs immediately for their family. I, I applaud that. So those are things that I have running through my head that I can leave this conference with, I hope. Um, and so I just wanted to share those thoughts. Could I say in the interest of time, because there's a panel tomorrow on the ethics of consumption that maybe we should leave. And the dairy panel, too. Yes.
are so disconnected from where the food comes from that they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, they have no idea what's actually going on to the real issue. So if we have a percentage mandated regional food percentage, for example, right now Vermont is the highest local food dollar retainage of any state in this nation. It's ten percent. Ten percent of the food dollars are spent on local food in the state of Vermont. New Hampshire's the worst, Massachusetts way worse. And you know, out west it's even we're not even there. Um, so how do we how do we get that to where it's thirty percent, forty percent of our dollars staying here? Well, Green Mountain Power has to locally purchase or produce with sustainable means a certain percentage of their power. Why can't we mandate that in food? It has to be very uncomfortable choices and consumer rebellion, so we can serve some way. Like no one said, cable TV, cheap food. <laughs> Unless we change that, it's not gonna change. So yeah. uh, let me let me take two questions here and then you guys just finish it up. Okay, so okay. rapid fire. Okay. Hi, um among the panelists, Lorraine represents a conventional farmer, and I'd just love to hear more because you said one of the most disturbing things I've heard today, which is you said our land taxes are higher than our farm income. And I think that's true for a lot of farmers in New York State, and in all fairness, conventional farmers produce at least 90% of our food, so that really concerns me. And just personally, and as you speak for many farmers, you know, why do you keep farming in that situation? Well, the, okay. just one more question yeah. and then you guys take it up. Okay. So what you're talking about here is green infrastructure. And as, as someone who's coming from a, an urban university where the, in New York City has just decided to invest billions of dollars in green infrastructure, how can we come up with a way to invest, make the same kinds of green infrastructure investments in our rural areas? Go. Okay, uh, I guess for us, our land is probably the most important thing in our lives. I mean, my family came from Poland 100 years ago. Um, the relatives who didn't get on the boat to come to Poland ended up being taken away to Siberia, where they then es escaped to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. They're struggling to get to Iran. Um, the land is our life. I mean, if we lost our land, we would be nobody. It, it's our total connection. So we would spend... You know, I mean, like when I pour my, I drain my law office account all the time to pay to pay bills or to some of our neighbors will call for an emergency. We can't make the payroll or we, we can't do this or we have our withholding taxes. I always say, I mean, I, you know, money is good, but you know, it's, it's only money. The land is more important. Hmm. Does anyone else want to speak to that on the conventional farming thing? Yeah, I mean, New York is the number one tax state in the nation. Our farmers face high taxes there. They also get a number of tax support measures, but in some cases, I think they're not necessarily strong enough to deal with what's going on with the broader agricultural economy. So um, it is an issue, and it is a way that I think communities and states can decide to further, further support farmers is to make the land taxes affordable for remaining in ag instead of going to development. Um, and there's definitely a cost of keeping these services Everybody is very much a regional 
Yeah, I, I do have a thing in New York that's going. Um, on Tuesday, I'm meeting with a group of farmers with Center for Ag Development Entrepreneurship. We're in Oneonta, New York, and we're trying to develop a, a regional identity for milk from our area or products from our area. Um, because I am, the, I like the regional notion very much. You know, if New York were a state like France, we would be many regions, you know, from the, so we're trying to develop, um, we're looking at um, some volunteer students, graphic artists um, coming up from New York City to help us um, try to do conceptualized logos. So that, that's one. And in terms of infrastructure, um, I'm not sure if you were talking about like what the NRCS pays for and getting that kind of infrastructure on farm and on ranch. But those, some of those programs, the, the EQUIP program, um, could be heavily bolstered with more technical service uh, providers, more money, uh, more ability to do whole farm planning um, and not just project to project, but a whole systems approach. Um, and then in terms of infrastructure that supports farmers to add value to product in communities, to make the, um, to put more money in a farmer's, rancher's pocket so they can develop infrastructure on farm ranch. Um, there are, I would say now, there's a Southeast New England fiber shed, a Maine fiber shed, a Connecticut fiber shed, a Western Mass fiber shed, and they're all evaluating the supply chains in New England right now to understand how to reinvest in milling infrastructure that has become defunct or has become too small to process things affordably. And I think once we see infrastructure tethered to what we might call regenerative agriculture, climate beneficial agriculture, that the, that hard infrastructure, that mechanical infrastructure that brings valued products into communities, um, that money can start cycling. Like as Nico was saying, 10% of the dollars in Vermont are staying in Vermont with food. I and mean, we need to see that with all of our material culture. And I think that will shift a larger green infrastructure conversation. And then we need federal, yes, there's a lot of Green New Deal um, needed. <laughs> okay, I just like very just one, briefly. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the main problems in the United States is that we don't pay enough for our food. We have other priorities. And that is the underlying structural issue that we have. Europeans expect to pay twice the percentage of their gross income than Americans do for their food. And that is reflected in the quality, in the land management, and in the kind of stuff that we're talking about, cooperatives, uh, local culture, and all the benefits for society that come along with that. And unless we can start thinking about maybe spending the money where it matters, meaning maintaining the cultural landscape that agriculture can provide, and bringing nutrition back into our food supply instead of uh, buying moms to uh, throw a 